From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Welcome to this Cube Virtual Conversation. I'm Lisa Martin, and I'm excited to be talking to one of our Cube alumni again, very socially distant. Derek Mankey joins me, the Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances at Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs. Derek, it's great to see you, even though virtually. Yeah, better safe, better safe these days, right? But yeah, it's, it's great to see you again, and uh, I'm really looking forward to a great conversation as always. Yeah, so wow, has a lot changed yeah. since I last saw you? I, I think that's an epic understatement. But each year we talk with you about the upcoming, what's coming up in the threat landscape, what you guys are seeing, some of the attack trends. What are some of the things that you've seen in this very eventful year since we last spoke? Yeah, a lot of lot of things. Um, obviously, uh, with the pandemic, there's been a big shift in landscape, right? So particularly uh, Q3, Q4, so the last half of the year. Uh, now we have a lot of uh, things that were traditionally in corporate safeguards, um, you know, actual workstations, laptops that were sitting within networks and perimeters of, of organizations that have obviously moved to, to work from home. And so with that comes a lot of new uh, attack opportunities. Uh, we track, as you know, threat intel at Fortinet, uh, FortiGuard Labs on a daily basis. And uh, we are clearly seeing that. And we're seeing a huge rise in things like um, IOT targets being the number one attacks. So consumer grade routers, um, uh, IOT devices like uh, printers, network attached storage. Those are um, some of the most uh, favorite attack vehicles that cyber criminals are using to get into dev those devices. Of course, once they get in those devices, they can then move, move laterally to compromise the uh, corporate laptop as an example. Uh, so those are, are very concerning. Uh, the other thing has been that email traditionally has been our number one, um, another favorite attack platform, always has, man. it's not going away. But for the first time this year in, um, in about September, the second half, we saw uh, web-based attacks uh, taking priority for attackers. And that's because of this new work from home environment. Uh, a lot of people um, surfing the websites from, again, these devices that were, uh, were previously within um, you know, organizations. Email security is centralized a lot of the times, but the web security always isn't. So that's another another shift that we've seen. We are now in the full-blown midst of uh, the online shopping season. Um, actually, the online shopping season is almost every day now <laughs> since the summer. Yep. Everybody yep. And we've clearly seen that. And we're, we're, we just from September to October, we saw over a trillion, not a billion, but a trillion new flows to shopping websites uh, in just one month. Um, so that, that number continues to rise and the threats are rising with it. Yeah, so the, the expanding threat landscape, I've talked to a number of companies the last few months that were in this situation where suddenly it was a maybe 100% on-site workforce now going to work from home, taking uh, either desktops from uh, their offices or using personal devices. So that was a huge challenge that we were talking about with respect to endpoint and laptop security. But interesting that you, you're seeing now this web security. I do know phishing emails are getting more personal, but the fact that, um, that website attacks are going up. What are some of the things that you think, especially when you bring up a point, we are, we are now in maybe even more supercharged e-commerce season, how can businesses prepare and, and become proactive to defend against some of these things that since now the threat surface is even bigger? Yeah, multi-pronged multi approach. Um, so, you know, Lisa, like we, we always say that, first of all, it's just like we have physical uh, distancing, cyber distancing, yeah. um, just like we're doing now on, on, on this call. Uh, but same thing for, for you. I, I think there's always a false sense of security, right? When you're just in the home office uh, doing um, some browsing to a, a site, you really have to understand that these sites just by touching it, literally touching it by going to a URL and clicking on that link, you can get infected that easy. We're seeing that there's a lot of these attacks being driven. So education, there's a lot of free programs. We have one at Fortinet information and security awareness training. That is something that we continually need to hone the skills of, of end users, first of all. So that's an easy, even I would say from, from my eyes in, in terms of uh, organizations. But then um, uh, this multi-pronged approach, right? So things like uh, um, uh, having a EDR, endpoint detection and response, being able to manage those, those end users well there uh, on, on their devices at home, um, being able to have security and making sure those are up to date in terms of patches. So that's really centralized management is 
important. Two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, uh, also equally as important. Uh, doing things like ne network segmentation for end users and the devices too. So there's a lot of these things. If you look at the risk that's associated, the risk is always way higher than the investment upfront in terms of hours, in terms of security platform. So the good thing is there's a lot of solutions out there and it doesn't have to be complicated. That's good because we have enough complication everywhere else. But you, you bring up a point you know, about humans, about education. We're kind of always that weakest link, but so many of us now that are home have distractions going on all around. So you might be going, I've got to do some bill pay and go on to your bank without thinking that that's, that's now a threat landscape. What are some of the things that you're seeing that you think we're going to face in 2021, which is just around the corner. Yeah, so um, so we're just talking about those IoT devices. They're the main culprit right now. They're going to continue to be for a while. But we have this new class of threat, emerging technology, which is edge computing. So people always talked about the perimeter, the perimeter being dead. On, in, in other words, not just building up a wall on the outside, but understanding what's inside, right? That's been the case of IoT, but now edge computing is the emerging technology. The, the, the main difference, uh, you know, Lisa, is that the edge devices are, uh, virtual assistant is the is the best example I could give, right? That, that users would be aware of in, in home networks. Because these devices traditionally have more processing power, they handle more data, they have more access and privilege to devices, like things like security systems, lights as an example, um, in, in beyond home networks, these edge devices uh, are also, uh, as an example, being put into military and defense, into critical infrastructure, uh, field units for oil and gas and, and electricity, as an example. So this is the new emerging threat, more processing power, more access and privilege, smarter decisions that are being made on those devices. Those devices are going to be targets for cyber criminals. And that's something I think next year we're going to see a lot of because it's a, um, a bigger reward to the cyber uh, criminal if they can get into it. And uh, so, so targeting the edge is going to be a big thing. I think there's going to be a new class of threats. I'm calling these, I haven't heard this coined in the industry yet, but I'm calling these EATs or edge access Trojans, because that's what it is. If they compromise these devices, they can then uh, control and get access to the data. If you think of a virtual assistant and somebody can actually compromise that device, think about that data voice data that's flowing through those devices that they can then use as a cleverly engineered, you know, um, attack, a social engineering attack to fish a user as an example. Wow, I never thought about it from that perspective before. Do you think with all the talk about 5G and, and what's coming with 5G, is that going to be an accelerator of some of these trends of these EATs that you talk about? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so 5G is just a conduit. It's an accelerator. Absolutely. Um, catalyst, call it what you will. Uh, it's here. Um, it's been deployed, not worldwide, but in many regions, it's going to continue to be. 5G is all about um, speed, um, right? And so if you think about how swiftly these attacks are moving, you, be, you need to be able to keep up with that from a uh, defense standpoint. Um, threats move without borders. They move without, uh, unfortunately, without restriction a lot of the time, right? Cybercrime has no borders. Uh, they, they don't have rules, or if they have, they don't care about rules, so they'll break those rules. So they are able to move quickly, right? And that's what the problem with 5G, of course, is that these devices now can communicate quicker. They can launch even larger scale things like DDoS, the distributed denial of service um, attacks. And that is, is a very big threat. And it also allows, the other thing about 5G, Lisa, is that it allows um, peer to peer connectivity too. Right, so it's like Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth um, enhanced in a sense. Because now you have devices that interact with each other as well. By interacting with each other, um, that also, uh, you know, what are they talking about? What data are they passing? That's a whole new security inspection point that we need to. And th that's what I mean about this. Um, it's just reconfirms that the perimeter is dead. Right, something we've been talking about, as you said, for a while, but. That's some pretty hard hitting evidence that it is indeed a thing of the past. Something that we've talked to you about with you in the past is swarm attacks. How, what's what's going on there? How are they progressing? Yeah, so this is a real threat. The, the, there's good news, bad news. And the good news is this is a long progressing threat, which is means we have more time to prepare. Um, the bad news is we have seen developments in terms of weaponizing this. Um, it's like anything, Swarm is a tool. It can be used for good. DARPA, as an example, has invested a lot into this uh, from military research. It's all around us now in terms of good applications um, from um, things like 
uh, uh, for redundancy, right? Uh, robotics is an example. There's a lot of good things that come from swarm technology, but if it's used in, uh, for, uh, if it's weaponized, it, it can have uh, some um, very scary um, prospects. And that's what we're starting to see. There's a new botnet that was created this year. It's called HEH. This is written in Golang. So it's a language that basically allows it to infect any number of devices. It's not just your PC. Right, it's the same. It's the same virus, uh, but it can morph into um, all these different platforms, devices. Whether it's a uh, an IoT device, an edge device, and but the main characteristic of this is that it's able to actually have communication. They built a, a communication protocol into it, so the devices can pass files between each other, talk to the, uh, talk to each other. They don't have machine learning models yet. So in other words, they're not quote unquote smart <laughs> yet, but that's coming. Once that, that intelligence starts getting baked in, then we have the, the weaponized swarm technology. And what this means is, is that the, you know, when you have those devices that are making decisions on their own, talking to each other, A, they're harder to kill. You take one down, another one takes its place. B, um, they're able to move very uh, swiftly, especially when le piggybacking and leveraging on things like 5G. So the, I'm just blown away at of all these things that you're talking about there. So talk about how companies and even individuals can defend against this and become proactive. Because we know, one of the things we know about 2020 is all the uncertainty. We're going to continue to see uncertainty, but we also know that we there's expectation globally that a good amount of people are going to be working from home and connecting to corporate networks for a very long time. So how can companies and people become proactive against these threats? Yes, uh, people, process, procedures, and technology. So um, we talked, you know, as I really looked at, at this as a stacked approach. Um, first of all, threats are moving, as I just said, they're becoming quicker. The attack surface is larger. You need threat intelligence, visibility. This comes down to security uh, platforms from a technology piece. So uh, security driven networking, um, uh, AI driven security operations centers. These are these are new, um, but it's it's becoming, as you can imagine from what we talked about, critical to fill that gap, to be able to move as quickly as the attackers, you need to be able to use intelligent technology on your end. People are just too slow, but we can still use people from the process, uh, you know, making sure, you know, um, trying to understand what the risk is. So looking at threat intelligence reports, we put out weekly threat intelligence briefs as an example of supporting our labs to be able to understand what the threats are, how to respond to those, how to prioritize them, and then put the proper security measures in place. So there are absolutely relevant technologies that exist today. Um, and in fact, now I think is a time to, to really get those in deployment before this becomes worse as, as we're talking about. Um, and then, as I said earlier, there's also free things that can be just part of our daily lives, right? So we don't have this false sense of security. So understanding that that threat is real, following up on the threat, and being uh, doing uh, education, there's um, uh, phishing services. For, again, phishing can be a good tool <laughs> when it's used in a, in a non-malicious way to test people's skill sets as an example. Um, so all of that combined is, is ways, but the biggest thing is definitely relying on things like machine learning, artificial intelligence to be able to work at speed with these threats. Right, so you also have global threat alliances under your portfolio. Talk to me about how Fortinet is working with global alliance partners to fight this growing attack surface. Yeah, so this is the ecosystem. Every every uh, organization, whether it's private or public sector, has a different role to play in essence, right? Uh, so you look at things in the public sector, you have law enforcement, they're focused on attribution. So when we look at uh, cyber crime, and if we find, it's the hardest thing to do, but if we find out who these cyber criminals are, we can bring them to justice, right? Our whole goal is to make it more expensive for cyber criminals to operate. So by doing this, if we work with law enforcement and it leads to a successful arrest and prosecution, which we've done in the past, that takes them offline, it hits them where it hurts. Um, you know, the law enforcement will typically work with intelligence leads to freeze assets as an example from maybe ransom attacks that are happening. So that's one aspect, but then you have um, other things like, working with a uh, national com computer emergency response. So disrupting cyber crime. We work with national cert. Uh, if we know that, you know, the bad guys are hosting stolen data or communication infrastructure in public, you know, servers, uh, we can work with them to actually disrupt that, to take those servers offline. And then you have the, the private space. So this, you know, we're a Fortinet, we're a founding member of the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, I'm on the steering committee there. 
And this is working with even competitors in our, in our space where we can share quickly up-to-date intelligence on, on attackers. We remain competitive on the technology itself, but you know we're, we're working together to actually share as much as we know about the bad guys. And uh, recently, we're also a founding member of the Center for Cybersecurity, C4C, uh, with the World Economic Forum. And this is another crucial effort that is basically trying to, to bridge all of that I talked, you know, mend all that together, right? Law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, you know, um, uh, security vendors, intelligence organizations, um, all under one roof because we really do need that. It's an entire ecosystem to make this an effective fight. So it's, it's interesting because a lot of people, I don't think, see what's happening behind the scenes a lot of the times, but there is a tremendous effort globally that's happening between all, all the players. Um, so that's really good news. And um, the industry piece is something close to my heart. Uh, I've been involved in a long time and, and we continue to support. That's exciting. And that's something that is, uh, you know, unfortunately so very, very needed and will continue to be as emerging technologies evolve and we get to use them for good things. And to your point, the bad actors also get to take advantage of that for nefarious things as well. Derek, it's always great to have you on the program. Uh, any particular things on the Fortinet website that you would point uh, viewers to, to learn more about like the 2020 threat landscape? Sure, you can always check out our blog. So it's on blog.fortinet.com under threat research. Um, as I said, on fortiguard.com, we also have our playbooks on there. We have podcasts, we have our updated um, threat intelligence briefs too. Uh, so those are always great to check out and, and just be rest assured uh, you know, everything I've been talking about, we're doing a lot of that heavy lift on the back end. So by having, working with managed security service providers and having all this intelligence baked in, organizations don't have to go and, and have a huge OPEX by, you know, hiring, um, you know, trying to create a massive security center on their own. I mean, it's about this technology working together and that's, that's what we're here for is for the next 40 guard labs. Awesome. Derek, thank you so much for joining me today in this CUBE conversation. Lots of exciting stuff going on at 49 and 40 Guard Labs, as always, which we expect. It's been great to have you. Thank you. Great. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. For Derek Mankey, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching the Virtual CUBE.